Um, I have the pleasure of introducing our next speaker, Dr. Rob Venick, um, who did his medical school in, at USC and residency here in pediatrics at UCLA, followed by pediatric GI here at UCLA. He's board certified in pediatric gastroenterology and pediatric transplant hepatology, and has been a really helpful partner to us in the management of our Fontan patients with chronic hepatic congestion, as well as more advanced liver disease. He was a member of the ACC working group um, of stakeholders for Fontan hand associated liver disease um, that resulted in a consensus statement back in 2015 as well. Um, thank you, Dr. Venick. He'll go over um, liver disease in the front hand patient. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Jeanette, and thank you all uh, for being here on a Saturday and to the organizers for the opportunity to talk with you over these next 15 minutes about uh, Fontan associated liver disease. I do have uh, nothing to disclose, and in this next uh, short segment, th these are the topics that I'd like to cover. Uh, the pathophysiology from a liver standpoint of the Fontan, uh, some of the screening and stratification tools that we use uh, when looking at these patients and from a multidisciplinary standpoint, and then from a hepatology standpoint, some of the therapeutic options that we have to deal with some of the complications that we see in Fontan-associated liver disease. So as was highlighted by Dr. Reardon and others, as a, the number of adults certainly who've had Fontans ha, have increased over the decades. The recognition of Fontan-associated liver disease is now uh, uh, front and center uh, in this field. And in terms of the pathophysiology, I think this highlights uh, from the uh, consensus uh, uh, statement and others uh, the, the common factors that are driving this. Uh, number one, increased CVPs in these patients and uh, decreased cardiac output that then places a, a burden on the liver, which can lead to a spectrum uh, of uh, disorders, including uh, on the end of, one of the spectrum, cirrhosis and its complications. Uh, this uh, schematic from the more recent publication and uh, guidelines from the uh, circulation paper earlier this year uh, highlights some of this pathophysiology as well. The top box in this cartoon, again, uh, sort of uh, highlights those from the previous slide. But patients who undergo Fontans also have perioperative insult uh, to their liver. And then, of course, as we all are aware, additional factors that can uh, cause liver issues, such as uh, medications, uh, viral infections, alcohol, uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, et cetera. And over time, this can certainly lead uh, to scarring in the liver. The most common early thing that we see in children uh, in the first five years uh, or five to 10 years post-Fontan is this entity of congestive hepatopathy. And um, uh, I think this demonstrates, uh, this slide demonstrates this quite well. Uh, we see sinusoidal dilatation, so normally the hepatocytes would be quite tight, but especially around the central veins, as you have increased uh, back, uh, backup, if you will, or, or increased CVPs, you have more of that white space in between the sinusoids. I think the other thing that stands out uh, from a hepatology standpoint is that there's very little inflammation, uh, at least early on in Fontan-associated liver disease. Um, as opposed to uh, most other things that we uh, uh, study and, and see in, in patients with chronic liver disease. And then over time, uh, the blue here is a, this is a trichrome stain. The blue hi highlights fibrosis, which typically starts uh, sort of uh, pericentral and perisinusoidal and can expand. Um, and uh, over time, we know fibrosis is one of the, the main things that we worry about and try to accurately stage in Fontan uh, patients. So the manifestations of Fontan-associated liver disease in children, oftentimes it's simply labs, uh, maybe hepatomegaly um, imaging changes. And as we get further out from the Fontan, uh, ascites, uh, and that can be, of course, multifactorial with protein-losing enteropathy and uh, synthetic liver function uh, being uh, contributing factors there. Uh, portal hypertension, uh, the risk of hepatocellular carcinoma, while fortunately um, not uh, very prevalent, as we'll see, groups are reporting between 1 to 5 percent of patients, uh, of adults with font, uh, who've had Fontans being at risk of developing 
uh, HCC, and then some of the, the more rare advanced manifestations, hepatic encephalopathy and impaired synthetic liver function, uh, as shown there. When we try to think about these patients, I think one of the most important things uh, that we look at from a liver standpoint is duration from their Fontan. Uh, you, you see here in a, a very in single center and multi center studies, uh, this has been shown to be true. The duration from the Fontan probably is the most significant risk factor uh, for developing Fontan associated liver disease. You see uh, patients over 10 to 15 years having a fourfold increase in, in developing uh, liver disease, and then in the 15 to 20 year block, ninefold higher uh, uh, risk. Um, the cardiac function in, in certain series is also uh, shown to uh, certainly predict or impact the risk of Fontan-associated liver disease uh, and uh, fibrosis over time. So the modalities, and we'll go through these individually, uh, that we can use to screen our patients include labs, imaging, biopsy, as Dr. Abelholson mentioned, can be done transjugular or percutaneously by hepatology or interventional radiology or in the cath lab, um, uh, and then non-invasive biomarkers and uh, some of the scoring systems, and we'll highlight uh, all of these. In terms of the labs, this is um, from Cincinnati Children's. It's a relatively small uh, number of patients, but this case series looked at, at patients about 15 years out, I think it was the mean, uh, from their Fontan, so sort of adolescents, young adults. And the two most common lab abnormalities that we see tend to be AST elevation and GGT elevation. These are relatively mild uh, from our vantage point. Um, the uh, liver synthetic function tends to be intact, uh, certainly early on, but this can be hard to gauge sometimes because of PLE or because of patients who are on, on Coumadin. Uh, this was a, a nice multi-center study of about 60 adult patients uh, who uh, were uh, Fontan long-term survivors, and I think what this highlights quite well is that none of these labs correlate very well uh, with the risk of biopsy-proven cirrhosis. So when they looked at uh, patients who had biopsies within six months of laboratories, not a great correlation in terms of what the labs will tell us. And then I think uh, one of the other limitations of uh, laboratory screening in the Fontan patients, which we still continue uh, to practice, this is a paper from Japan looking again at uh, a relatively small number of patients, but I think this statement is quite true. They divided over uh, four time points and looked longitudinally at these liver function tests, and you don't see significant changes necessarily uh, that are in the labs that correlate sort of with the histology. Uh, so there certainly are limitations uh, to our labs and to how we can use them to screen our Fontan patients. One of the other labs that we use besides LFTs, of course, is alpha fetoprotein. This is a tumor marker. Uh, 10 to 20 percent of patients, though, who can develop HCC uh, may have normal AFP levels. And this is often true in patients with fibrolamellar tumors or very small tumors. Uh, we can also see false elevations uh, in AFP, um, where, which can cause, of course, a, a lot of concern. Uh, we tend to use cutoffs, and this is probably lab uh, specific, but AFPs, certainly over 20 nanograms per milliliter, get our attention, and uh, it still lacks a sensitivity and really to uh, discern between um, uh, focal nodular hyperplasia and HCC. That is a biopsy uh, a proven um, uh, issue. Uh, with imaging, as we'll, we'll see also, that can play a significant role. So speaking of imaging, the three modalities uh, from a liver standpoint that we can use include ultrasound, uh, CT scan, and MRI. The pros and cons are shown here. Obviously, ultrasound, non-invasive, cost-effective. We've tried to use elastography as a screening tool. I think, in general, elastography in a good portion of these patients tends to overcall the degree of fibrosis that they may have. It's also very volume dependent, so you can see variability uh, based on what time of day the ultrasound is done or if it's done uh, with uh, uh, clinical changes or diuretic changes. CT obviously gives us a more detailed look. Our pre prior speaker highlighted quite nicely uh, risks of long-term uh, CT uh, ex radiation exposure and contrast exposure. Uh, MRI we uh, like very much from a liver standpoint, specifically with the agent EOVIS that can help us differentiate focal nodular hyperplastic lesions 
from hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, some of the patients who have older pacemakers have to get uh, a, a, certainly approval from Dr. Moore or Dr. Shannon or discussion with them as to whether or not they may be MRI candidates uh, or not. Uh, the limitations, though, of imaging uh, are shown here. Imaging uh, also tends to overcall not just in ultrasound, but in the other modalities, the degree of fibrosis. Um, most young adults uh, do have some changes. This is sh uh, shown here from this multicenter uh, study. As you see, only 7% had no hepatic abnormalities, roughly uh, 20%, uh, and that's true, 20 to 30% of patients uh, further out from Fontan, we'll have cirrhosis with uh, some of these focal nodules. Uh, also, again, 40% uh, of the patients in this uh, series who were biopsied have less fibrosis on biopsy than was estimated on imaging. Um, the EOVEST, again, can be uh, quite helpful. The prevalence of HCC in this population probably somewhere between 1% and 5%, and I think that's in uh, adults, and that number uh, could be expected to increase as uh, the Fontan survivorship uh, certainly grows. Um, uh, some of the keys, uh, fo focal nodular hyperplasia tends to be in the periphery of the liver versus HCC, uh, perhaps not. We do have good uh, modalities to, to differentiate or risk stratify the need for biopsy um, with uh, uh, MRI. And uh, we do go after suspicious lesions, and that's quite important in our decision making for the team in terms of best medical management versus uh, uh, going forward with surgery for, for these patients. Um, so not only are targeted biopsies performed, uh, but biopsies to stage fibrosis to help in the decision making of the patients is quite important. This is really the gold standard to gauge fibrosis. This shows just a general uh, staging of fibrosis. It can be staged from uh, zero, no fibrosis, to four, which is, would be a cirrhotic patient. Oftentimes, stage two or three, uh, there can be some overlap. Um, in the Fontan patients, folks have raised in the literature whether we need a specific staging system uh, for these patients because, again, it looks very different than much of what we see in hepatology. There's uh, the lack of inflammation. Uh, uh, will the biopsies change uh, the management of these patients? I would argue yes, uh, but um, in some programs that's not been the, uh, what they've uh, published. And I think, as, as Jamil had highlighted, the need to take multiple biopsies because there can be a lot of heterogeneity. Uh, this recent publication had uh, noted that in a quarter of biopsies in which more than one biopsy was taken, at least there were greater than two stages difference in fibrosis between the predominant findings and secondary patterns of fibrosis. So uh, sometimes uh, just having a single uh, pass cannot give us enough information. Uh, and then, um, I'll just highlight some of the, the treatments uh, briefly that we can use for cardiogenic fibrosis. Obviously, our, car uh, our cardiology colleagues will uh, help with uh, decision-making and optimization of cardiac function. We then focus on avoiding second hits of alcohol abstinence, uh, trying to stay as active as possible and healthy diet to avoid uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, looking at medications that have potential hepatotoxicity, uh, making sure our patients show immunity to hepatitis A and B, and for those with HCV, uh, and now the direct-acting antivirals uh, are extremely effective in a short course with minimal complications. And then, of course, managing complications uh, as shown here, for example, with portal hypertension. Um, we know that that can occur in roughly 20% of Fontan patients. Uh, the modalities that we have available, beta blockers and venodilators, can be really challenging for these patients. Um, endoscopy or serial endoscopy with banding or sclerotherapy, also, you know, undergoing uh, a repeated anesthesia, not the best options, but these are uh, certainly available to help manage or bridge uh, towards uh, uh, at least uh, heart liver uh, uh, consideration patients. For ascites in general, our first line treatments would be sodium restriction and diuretics, aldactone or Lysix. Uh, abdominal paracentesis are really used for tense ascites uh, as it can be transient and may be associated with protein losing enteropathy. TIPS, very limited role in these patients because of their complex anatomy. Uh, hepatic encephalopathy, fortunately we don't see this with, fre with frequency in this patient population. Uh, but uh, lactulose or rifaximin, as well as pro protein 
uh, restriction or, or limiting protein intake uh, are sort of the mainstays of therapy there. Uh, I won't go into any detail with regards to HCC management other than uh, we can use uh, RFA, uh, uh, transarterial chemoembolization, serafinib, and surgery, and based on the number of lesions and the size of those lesions, uh, there's good consensus on how to best manage uh, patients who develop HCC from Fontan-associated liver disease. And then finally, just to wrap up with uh, how do we score or stratify these patients, this is the VAST uh, study from Emory um, in which one point is assigned to patients who either develop varices, ascites, splenomegaly with thrombocytopenia that occurs from splenic sequestration. And you can see in the patients on the right who had VAST scores greater than two, a significant higher number of them had adverse outcomes such as HCC, the need for transplant or mortality versus patients with VAST scores less than two, so a clinically useful uh, tool for us uh, uh, to look at. And then uh, this is another uh, predictor, which is MELD-XI, so the model for end-stage liver disease. If we exclude the INR, and again, this was mostly for patients on Coumadin, making the INR uh, a less useful tool, of course. Uh, the group at Boston Children had stratified, and as you can see there, survival um, uh, uh, transplant-free um, was uh, significantly uh, impacted in patients with higher meld excise scores. Some of the non-invasive uh, biomarkers, I'd say the fibrosure panel, uh, which is the last uh, bullet point there, is, being, is the most commonly used uh, these days. And um, th this needs to, uh, we need to develop multi-center, uh, sort of uh, look at this and to validate that as a tool. Um, and um, a transplantation, I think Dr. Caldas and others will talk about heart and heart liver, and that's certainly been uh, part of uh, UCLA's journey with uh, these patients, but uh, as more and more data emerges, uh, this is a very um, important in, in area of interest uh, to us. Uh, so um, uh, finally, uh, the screening recommendations that came out earlier this year, I think, are, are, are important, uh, but they're just that and need to be individualized. We see the basic components, laboratories, imaging, and liver biopsies, and the time at which these are needed uh, for individual patients, really, we have to communicate as a multidisciplinary team to determine the best care for our patients. So thank you again.